Right, uh, I want to talk to you about my idea of what nature's best work is, but before I do that, let's talk about, about E.O. Wilson's idea of nature's best work. Of course, Edward O. Wilson from Harvard, is one of the, or the most famous scientists, certainly entomologists in the world ever, died the day after Christmas this year. So a terrible loss for the world of conservation. One thing, and I've had a long career, but he had a much longer career, he did all kinds of things. One thing that was consistent throughout his career was his love of life and his desire to save it. He saw it disappearing. He was extremely alarmed because he knew it was not optional. We need nature. We depend on it. <laughs> we're talking about eels. He knew we had to save life. And he said, if we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we have to save nature. We have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet. Or it's going to disappear everywhere. And of course, that leads us to. Uh, so he wrote this book, Half Earth, A Planet's Fight for Life. Uh, and that was his message. He spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement. He's not just making it up. There's really they're good numbers that support that statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't spend a lot of time talking about how we were going to save nature on half of planet Earth. Of course, conservation biologists think that's a, a great idea. We'll just put half the Earth aside. and. Be wonderful. The problem is half of, of terrestrial Earth is already in some form of agriculture. That's kind of off the table right now. Uh, the other half has just about 8 billion people increasing every day uh, with all of our houses and detritus and roadways. And, and, and we don't have a third half to put aside for, for nature. So how can we actually do this? That's what I want to talk about today. I think we can do it. I think we can realize EO's dream, but we need a new approach to conservation in order to do that. But before we talk about that approach, let's talk about a, an oak mast that occurred uh, over most of the East Coast in 2019. Uh, the Red Oak Group, members of the Red Oak Group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And that's what it looked like in a lot of places. Yeah. Well, I'm usually entertained, so I just took one of those acorns and I stared at it. And I was rewarded because an insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. First it chewed a little hole for its head, then it forced its head through there, and of course, its entire body through that little hole. It was a tight squeeze. <laughs> Once it pops down, a very dangerous time for that insect larva because it's good to eat. Everything wants, wants to come eat that. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming beneath the soil surface in about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, stretches in all directions and, be, and, and forms a chamber. And within that chamber, it converts itself to a pupa. And then surprisingly, it stays as a pupa in that underground chamber for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. That's what an acorn weevil looks like. A lot of people think weevils have big noses, because it looks like they do. But that's actually an extension of their, their head capsule, and the mouth parts are way down there at the end of that extension. And they take those mouth parts and chew a hole into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in that hole, and that's how the larva gets into the acorn. Why do they spend two years underground? Why don't they come out the next year like most insects would? And the answer is, it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the very next year, there wouldn't be enough acorns for them. Of course, once they leave the acorn, it's a hole. It's kind of like a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of temnothoraxans, tiny little ants where the entire colony lives in the holes made by acorn weevils after the acorn weevil has left the acorn. And if scouts find a new hole and a new acorn, they get all excited because their old acorn's falling apart. So they tell everybody, it's time to move. They grab the larvae, they grab the eggs, they move the entire colony into the new acorn. Uh, it takes about 30 minutes. And once they're in there, they post a guard, make sure that nobody else can come in. And that's where they live for the next two years until that acorn starts to fall apart. So what's my point with this little story? That's just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions, largely between animals and, and plants, that comprise the bulk of nature. That's another one right there, the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays are the primary disperser of oak acorns. They'll take an acorn and fly up to a mile from the parent tree, and then they tap it below the surface of the ground. And the object is they're going to go back in the wintertime and have something to eat. Well, for every four acorns they bury, they only remember where one is. So for every four acorns they bury, they're actually planting three oak trees. Specialized relationship between pileated woodpeckers and, and uh, no, yeah, pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. This guy's beak is full of carpenter ants. He's going to feed it to his his baby right there. 
That's what they really are on carpenter ants. So uh, you won't have pileated woodpeckers unless you have a lot of carpenter ants, and you won't have a lot of carpenter ants unless you have the big trees to make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena facilia, unless you have facilia. That is the only plant that that bee can reproduce on. The only pollen it can use to rear its young. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We've got about 4,000 species of native bees. Only one honeybee, but 4,000 species of, of native bees, and over a third of them reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. If you take those plants away, you lose those species. You won't have the Volterra or checker spot unless you have white turtle head. I could talk all day, all year, about nature's specialized relationships. The point I want to make this morning, though, is that these relationships, nature itself, uh, is now on the ropes. It's on the ropes largely because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, looked out over the edge, and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, we didn't leave it as it was, not most of it anyway. There's only 5% of the U.S. that's anything close to its original pristine ecological state. And those are largely mountaintops. Uh, and that's because we have, we have logged the country repeatedly. We have tilled it. We have drained it. We have grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland. Uh, in this country, that's, that's four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to cattle. And of course, we've paved it or otherwise developed it. I think the word development is the most oxymoronic word in certainly all of ecology. Uh, we've straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you in Florida know about that. And of course, you can spell that any way you want. Uh, we have changed our, we've polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we've carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated to sustain the amount of nature necessary to sustain us. So why have we done this? I don't know. But I suspect we thought that our nest, planet Earth, was so large we could follow it forever, indefinitely, and there'd be no consequences. Uh, but of course, we were wrong about that, and that's why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines these days, like the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Talking about global insect decline. Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our, our North American bird population, already gone. Now the UN says we're going to lose a million species to extinction, probably in the next 20 years. And they said it two years ago, so maybe it's the next 18 years now. Makes a nice headline, but it is not an option, folks. Those are the species that keep us alive. So, you know, this, this has got to be a call to action, not just something to read in the New York Times or the Washington Post, wherever they said it. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment, and thus upon all of our houses. But that is not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that will take small efforts from a lot of people, people like you and me. But those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. If you turn briefly to this headline, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Back to E.O. Wilson. He told us what it would mean if Earth lost its insects. And he did it way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. And again, his message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would so drastically change the physical structure uh, of our, our terrestrial ecosystems, energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems, that the food webs that support our, our particularly our vertebrates, our amphibians, our reptiles, our birds, our mammals, those food webs would, would collapse and those animals would all disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth, would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that rapidly turn over nutrients, and all we would have is, is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is some good news here, and that is that none of that has to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on the life support 
that healthy ecosystems provide. We call them ecosystem services. And here are just a few things that plants do that we depend on, like produce oxygen, like clean water, slow its journey to the sea where it's too salty to use, carbon capture, enormously important in today's world, pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, locking it up in their tissues, uh, and then pumping the extra carbon into the ground. That's the ultimate solution. A third of the carbon that's in the atmosphere right now has come from us chopping down the, the forests and the plants on this planet. So if we put them back, the carbon dioxide is pulled out of the atmosphere, and then the extra carbon is pumped in the ground through the root systems where it's stable for thousands and thousands of years. Plants build topsoil, and they hold it in place. They prevent floods. They dampen severe weather. That's good. They convert sunlight into food. If we lost our plants, we'd have to eat sunlight. I hope that's not for lunch today. <laughs> Uh, what do animals do for plants? They, they provide pest control services. That's, that's good. They pollinate, again, nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds and many other things. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is just not a good idea. It never was a good idea, but today it's a terrible idea because of those 8 billion people that are demanding more and more services every day. Now, we do have parks. We do have preserves. And they're doing the best they can, but it's not good enough, and that's why we are now in the sixth great extinction event that the Earth has ever experienced. Which means we now have to practice conservation outside of parks and preserves on landscapes just like that. <coughs> there have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet Earth, and Aldo Leopold was one of the most eloquent, wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said is that the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. There have been indigenous groups been able to do that for long periods, but our huge Western societies and our huge Asian societies are terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the earth than it has to offer, completely wrecking an area, going to another area, doing the same thing. Um, not sustainable behavior. But Aldo Leopold had a dream. He, he really believed that we humans were smart enough that we could develop what he called a land ethic. He knew we had to use the land. We had to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all of those things. But he believed we could learn to do them gently enough that we did not destroy the life support that keeps us on this planet. We did not destroy local ecosystems. That's what he called the land ethic, and he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he did not write about, though, was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. And I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that humans and nature cannot live together. We cannot coexist in the same place at the same time. That notion was so deeply embedded in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, it's still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have recognized it as an option. But what I want to argue this morning is that not only is it an option, it's now the only viable option that's left to us. In the past, of course, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and practice conservation where there are a lot of people, because that's pretty much everywhere. In other words, we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. Not hang on by a thread, but thrive. Where should we start? Let's go back to private property. Most of the land is privately owned. 78% of the entire country is privately owned. 85.6% of the U.S. is, is uh, privately owned, east of the Mississippi. If we don't practice conservation on private property, we're going to fail. And by the way, failure is not an option. Remember, if we lose nature, we're going to. People don't believe that, but it's so true. When I use the words conservation, I am not using it correctly. We do want to conserve any bits of nature that are left, absolutely. And that's what we've been doing for the last century. So we want to keep doing that. But I'm talking about putting it back. I'm talking about restoration. Rebuilding the areas that we have, where we have dismantled functional ecosystems. And before you tell me you're never going to put it back the way it was before we dismantled it. I get that. Um, but it doesn't mean we can't recreate functional ecosystems. Ecosystem function even if it's not exactly what was at that spot at some point in the past, by reuniting as many of those specialized interactions that comprise nature as possible. But in order to do that, we have to start with this, the building blocks. Uh, not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally, so we have to start with the most powerful groups, 
Uh, and two groups we can't do without would include the flowering plants and the pollinators that allow those plants to reproduce. They are capturing energy from the sun and turning it into food. Uh, and then, and that is the food that supports just about all the animals on the planet. But the food now is locked up in plant tissues, mostly leaves. Now most vertebrates do not eat plants directly. Most vertebrates eat something else that eat plants. And it's typically invertebrates that have eaten plants, typically insects, and not just any insect. It turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of, of uh, insect, any other type of plant eater. So if we develop landscapes that don't have enough caterpillars in them, we eventually will have failed food webs and then failed ecosystems. Let's use the Carolina chickadee as an example. That's the chickadee that you have down here on the island. Um, they're the birds that are at our feeders all winter long, eating seeds, and we tend to think that's what chickadees need. Well, 50% of their diet, even in the, in the winter time, only 50% is seeds. The other 50% is insects and spiders. And down here, that seems logical. There's still a lot of insects and spiders here in the winter time. But up north, not that many, but they still depend on them. When they go to reproduce, though, their young cannot eat seeds at all. So they have to switch off the, the seeds uh, onto invertebrates, mostly, well, entirely insects and spiders. And if they are in a healthy environment, they will rear their young exclusively on caterpillars. And they are not alone. 96% of the terrestrial birds in North America rear their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? a number of lines of evidence that suggest that, but this is, uh, this is a citizen science project that one of my students, Ashley Kennedy, did a few years ago. She put out a call to bird photographers across the country to take pictures of birds during the breeding season when they were bringing food to the nest. Uh, they were going to send those pictures to, to Ashley. She was going to identify all of the prey items that were in the beaks of the birds and reconstruct the nestling diet for as many species of birds in North America as, as possible. And she got thousands of pictures, very successful. She did a lot of identifying. You're looking at a summary of her, her results for the 20 most common bird families in North America. The green bars that you see there are the percentage of those nestling diets that were caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, what would happen if we, if we landscaped in a way where there wasn't enough caterpillars? Most of our birds would not be able to successfully reproduce. So, there's something special about caterpillars. Let's talk about what it is. Turns out there's actually several things special about caterpillars. One of them is that they're soft. The thing of this guy is that he's a little sausage <laughs> with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is its exoskeleton. It's made of chitin. It's undigestible. So the birds don't want a lot of that. And because they're soft, you can stuff a caterpillar down the throat of the, the baby without fear of injuring it. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, they're pretty rough. It's like a plunger, it just started. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, the second thing is that their caterpillars are relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but you want to chase 200 aphids or, or get one caterpillar. They're nutritious, they're very high in fat, very high in protein, very low percentage of chitin compared to other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible, uh, and a lot of beetles have really sharp edges too. And then finally, caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. And I mention carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate, and you're a vertebrate. And birds are vertebrates, and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids, so we have to get our, our carotenoids from plants. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. Where are the birds getting the carotenoids from? <clears throat> During the breeding season, before there's berries and other things that provide carotenoids, they're getting it from what they eat. But look, the, the carotenoid content of different types of bird prey is not at all equal. The first two bars you see here on the left are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of bird prey. The adult caterpillars, the moths and butterflies them, themselves, have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are, in the green leaves. And the earthworm, way over here at the end here, uh, the early bird gets the worm who doesn't get any carotenoids. <laughs> so 
So that study and several others are suggesting that for most birds, caterpillars are not optional parts of the bird diets. They are essential parts of most bird diets. So let's just say most birds need caterpillars. The next question is, how many do they need? Is one or two enough? One or two a day enough? Back to chickadees, we have a lot of data on chickadees. So how many caterpillars does it take to make a nest of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest, where they fledge. And then after they fledge, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars another 21 days before they're fully independent when they continue to eat caterpillars. You're talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars required to make one clutch of a bird that's a third of an ounce, four pennies worth of bird. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, and I would think you, you do, <coughs> because in so many places that's all we have is our yards, you have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because chickadees only forage about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. That's true for all the birds. They all forage very close to the nest because they're making hundreds of trips a day and they can't afford to be flying all over the world, energy-wise. And if we landscape in a way that does not produce all of those caterpillars, that's called insect decline. And it's really looking like insect decline is one of the major causes of the bird declines that we're seeing. We went to the original data set of Rosenberg et al. That's the Smithsonian group that said we've lost three billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial birds into two groups. These species that require insects at some part of their life history, typically when they are, are breeding. That's the bar over here on the left. And the species that do not require insects, the bar on the right. So things like doves and finches, they can actually make a milk out of seeds and they can reproduce on seeds. They don't need insects. And look, the group that doesn't need insects didn't decline at all in the last 50 years. But the group that requires insects declined on average 10 million individuals per species. <clears throat> and it doesn't prove cause and effect, but it does suggest as you take bird food away, you lose the birds. So we need a new goal for landscaping. In the past, we've had one goal for landscaping, and that is to make our landscapes pretty. And we're good at doing that. And we don't have to give that up. But we do now have to find ways to make our landscapes pretty and ecologically functional. We've got 135 million acres of residential landscapes. We can't just say, well, that doesn't count does count. So how do we make landscapes uh, beautiful and ecologically functional? You can't do it without adding caterpillars. So how do you add caterpillars to landscapes? You add the plants that support the caterpillars. That seems pretty straightforward. But there is a catch, and that is that most plants do not support a lot of caterpillars. So we have to be fussy about it. We have to choose the ones that do. <coughs> and we have to be fussy about it because the caterpillars themselves are fussy about it. And the monarch butterfly illustrates that perfectly. You can have all the crepe myrtle and all the burning bush and calorie pear and ginkgos and, and all of the non-native plants that we like to landscape with. They're mostly from Asia, but I guess as you move down here, then you can bring a bunch from South America up. You can have all of them in your yard if you want, and you won't make a single monarch butterfly. The only thing that's going to make a monarch butterfly is one of the milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization. And it turns out that most, most insects that eat plants are host plant specialists. They can only eat the particular plants for which they have developed specialized adaptations that allow them to get around the plant defenses. <coughs> and that's why insects have specialized. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And if you don't believe me, when you leave here today, eat a plant. <laughs> See if you like it. You're not going to like it. It's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green out there. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat the plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. They are too well protected. There is a reason why we can't get our kids to eat their vegetables. They inherently know they're toxic. <laughs> <laughs> but insects do eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those, those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. 90% of the insects that eat plants are specialized. They can only eat particular plants that they have the, the enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations 
that minimize the, the uh, insect's exposure to those particular compounds. It takes a long period of history with the plant lineage for all those adaptations to fall into place. And once they do fall into place, the insect is locked into eating that particular plant lineage. So you can take all the milkweeds out of your yard and replace them with hostas, but the monarch is not going to start to develop on your hostas. If you take the milkweeds out of your yard, the monarch has one choice, and two choices. Fly away and find, find milkweeds someplace else, or starve to death. And remember, 90% of the insects that are out there are just like the monarch. The monarch's not special. Very typical example of a host plant specialization. So let's boil it down to, into simplicity. I love simplicity. There are three kinds of plants out there. Plants that contribute energy to local food webs, plants that do not contribute energy to local food webs, and plants that actively detract energy from local food webs. Let's look at examples of each one. The best example of a contributor would be one of our oaks. This island is certainly blessed with oaks. That's a good thing. They're contributing more energy to food webs than any other type of plant in the entire country. A good example of a non-contributor would be a ginkgo. Ginkgo biloba from Asia. Nothing eats a ginkgo, which means it's not adding any energy to the local food web. It's not invasive, it's not moving around, but it's not contributing either. Good example of a, a non-contributor, a detractor, would be a uh, calorie pair or any of our invasive ornamentals that escape our yards and turn all of our, our natural areas into that. So not only are they not contributing energy, they're, excuse me, they're displacing the plants that do. That's, this is a, a conservancy property, by the way. <laughs> So all I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we want to rebuild the food webs to recreate ecosystem function in all the places where we've dismantled them, we've got to choose the right plants or it's not going to work. <clears throat> and I'm going to give you three examples of how well it does work when we do choose the right plants. Starting with my house, our house right here in, in uh, Oxford, Pennsylvania. That's what it looked like when we moved in in the year 2000. It was in a farm that had been broken up into 10 acre lots. Very old farm, been farmed for almost 300 years. Uh, they mowed it for hay, the last thing they, they uh, did before they, they broke it up. So very little there when we moved in, and our goal was to restore local habitat. Uh, well, I knew that you couldn't do that without bringing the caterpillars back, so um, I just started fooling around. How easily could we get various caterpillar species to start breeding on our property? I started with the Canadian owlet. I've never even seen a Canadian owl. People say, why do you, why do you choose a Canadian owl? Because I looked through Dave Wagner's Caterpillars of Eastern North America. I said, that's a pretty one. <laughs> <laughs> that's what the adult looks like, just like a leaf. Well, you don't have Canadian owls unless you have meadow root. Just like monarchs only, need, only use milkweed, Canadian owls only use meadow root. We didn't have any meadow root. Uh, I'm sure there was meadow root there a couple hundred years ago, but the whole area was farmed to death, long gone. So I got some meadow seeds from someplace. I planted them really nicely. But this was early on, and uh, I had very little faith that Canadian outlets would find my little patch of, of meadow. So I didn't even go out and check it for about two months after I planted it. And then I was walking by for another reason, and I looked over. It was covered with Canadian outlets. They had found it right away. I'm still impressed with that. So now we have a good population of Canadian outlets and meadow root. We've added two species to the property. The restoration has begun. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. That's a misnomer. That beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a special sun. This plant, uh, Biden's aristosa. <coughs> well, we didn't have any Biden's aristosa, but I did know where there was a, a patch of Biden's aristosa. It's called ditch daisy. Uh, in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I got some, some seeds, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. As a matter of fact, this year they took over my front front yard. That's my front lawn. You know how many of those I planted? None. <laughs> I planted them along a rock wall in another place. They didn't want to be there. They wanted to be in my front yard. And, and I achieved that by simply stop. I saw them coming up, so I stopped mowing. It was pretty easy. So we got a lot of Biden's aristosa, but it took a full year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my Biden's. But they did. And now we've got a good population of both of those. So we've added four species to the property. One at the Hackberry Emperor. Not because it's the most beautiful butterfly in the world, but because it belongs in my yard. 
But as its, its name suggests, it's specialist on hackberry, on Celtis. We didn't have any hackberry. So I planted a couple of hackberry trees. It took four years for the hackberry emperor to find my hackberry trees, but they did. And now we've got a good population of those. So now we've added six species to the property. And that's how the restoration proceeded. I did not plant goldenrod. It came in on its own. And along with it came uh, many things that depend on goldenrod, like the beautiful brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaganothus, the goldenrod gall moth. Now this, curiously enough, the goldenrod flower moth is one that has not come yet. I don't know why it hasn't come yet. That's, that's what its caterpillars look like. Uh, but it's still part of the fun. It's anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year, every year I go out and look for the caterpillars of this, this guy. One of these years I'm going to find it, and that'll be a great year. Find a Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper. I hear people don't like Virginia creeper. But I don't know why. It's a great native plant. It's got good fall color. It can climb our trees without girdling them, without pulling them down. It's a good uh, ground cover. It makes valuable berries for the birds in the fall. Valuable meaning they are high in fat. That's what the birds, migrating birds want. They want high fat berries for energy. <clears throat> and those berries come from tiny little inconspicuous flowers in, in the early summer. You don't even know it's in bloom until you see the big cloud of native bees around it. <clears throat> so it's a great pollinator plant. Remember, when you are planting a pollinator garden, you're planting it for the pollinators. If it's not big and showy for you, it's okay. I planted Virginia creeper because it's the best host plant for the big sphinx moths that are a primary component of cardinal diets, things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. I want to see if I get the double tooth prominent in my house just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar. Even if you don't like caterpillars. Does anybody here who doesn't like caterpillars? <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually had, I had a lady in the front row, this was years ago would not look at a picture of caterpillar every time one comes to the I said, I'm going to get you to look at a caterpillar by the end of the talk, but I failed. She wouldn't do it. <laughs> anyway, cool looking caterpillar. I wanted it. Um, went to see if we could get it. But it's a specialist on elm, American elm, mostly American elm. And of course, we didn't have any American elms. We lost some of the Dutch elm disease decades ago. But there are two big American elms at the University of Delaware that did not die. They dropped a lot of seeds every year, so I got some seeds out of the gutter, planted them at home. They germinate in six days. They grow rapidly. Those trees are 80 feet tall now. Wow. <laughs> they have not died from the Dutch elm disease, and they brought in the double tooth prominent, American elm. Uh, why do the evening primrose smell? Because it's beautiful. I like beauty like anybody else. Uh, well, believe it or not, I didn't have any evening primrose, so I planted that. The moth came and spends the day with its head stuck in the flowers. It's very cute. Sometimes it gets crowded. But. And I planted lots of, of oaks. Uh, and now those are just examples of the plant lineages we put back. We put back more than that. But, and we continue to do it. But I want to focus on oaks for all because they are such important species. That's the Bedford oak in Bedford, New York. Martha Stewart land. Uh, people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And I hear people say, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And if you can only enjoy your oak when it's 400 years old, you're right. <laughs> but if you can enjoy what your oak is contributing to your local ecosystem, you can enjoy it right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which means they were free, or two-foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And immediately, they started to support the moths that create the caterpillars that run the ecosystem to support all my birds and do everything else in my yards. Bringing in things like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shoulder moth, yellow shoulder moth, Suzuki's promalactus, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the hesitant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth. <laughs> The streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bugalatrix, the orange pad smoky wing, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laughter, and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks on my property. I just love it when people clap for the oaks. They are indeed the best plants. That's the laugher. 
See, he's laughing at you. <laughs> they come right away. This is why you don't have to wait decades or a hundred years for your oaks to start to support your local food web. That's a pinot that just popped its head above the leaves, and there's a caterpillar standing on the ground eating the, the leaves wow. of that plant. And then a bird's going to come and eat that caterpillar. I've got a functional food web immediately, the very first year. That's what our property looks like kind of today. Right there is where those vitamins replace them. The point is we put the plants back. Uh, some of the plants, still working on it. So over the years, I, I, uh, our research has shown that if you count the number of, of essentially the number of moth caterpillars, the number of moth species in your yard, the reason I don't count butterflies, I will count them eventually, is that butterflies are bad tasting, day flying moths. That's what the, the DNA analyses show. They're flying during the day because most of them taste bad and birds don't, don't like them. So they're not huge contributors to our local, local food webs. It's the moths that do that. And if you know the number of species of moth in your food web, you know how stable it is and you know how productive it is. It's an index of, of in food web productivity. So five years ago, I started to take a picture of every species of moth I could find on my property. I am still doing it, but I'm up to 1,195 species. They're now making a living where, believe me, they weren't making a living before. And we've got 10 acres. Pennsylvania is 2.5 million acres, 2.4 million acres. So on one 240,000th of the land mass, we're supporting 44% of the species, all the moss species that occur in the entire state. And because so many of those species are types of bird food, we have recorded 60 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. Why am I telling you this? Well, this is another headline we see all the time. World Wildlife Fund says Earth has lost two-thirds of its wildlife since 1970. It's a terrible statistic. But I'm thinking, not in our house. I'm convinced we have increased biodiversity by more than two-thirds. It didn't take that long, and it wasn't that hard. We just put the plants back. What would happen if everybody put the plants back? Yeah, there are a few species that, you know, I'm not going to have a rhinoceros in my yard or something. <laughs> but we can save a lot of it if we just put the plants back. So don't give up. That's the message here. But I know what you're thinking. We've got 10 acres. A lot of people have less land than that. Will it work on smaller properties? Uh, that is a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0.6 acres, 18 times less land than Cindy and I have. They're in the middle of a development. All their neighbors have the big lawns. <coughs> When they moved into their property, it was choked with bush honeysuckle. Amur honeysuckle, another major invasive species from, from Asia. So they got rid of that. They planted 70 species of native plants, put in a water feature that they call a bubbler, and then they sat back and started to count the birds that are using their yard. That's their index of productivity. I'm counting moths, they're counting birds. They're up to 149 bird species that have used their yard, including 35 worker species. Just to put that in perspective, we've only recorded eight warbler species at our house. So does it work on smaller properties? Yes, it does. How about urban yards? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago. Right on the other side of that wall there is O'Hare Airport. She's right next to the airport. She has one-tenth of an acre. That is three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. And she's not connected to any natural area at all. Uh, so it's a pretty one-tenth of an acre. Pam is a, a native plant landscaper. Uh, but it's, it's an island. She's a little teeny island. But she did the same thing. She got rid of her non-native plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a little water feature, and then she sat back, she says, with a glass of wine. <laughs> and she's counting her birds. She's up to 124 bird species. I suspect she's had more than one glass of wine. But 124 bird species, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. If you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Chicago. <laughs> Pam will let you see. All right, there's four things we need to think about if we're going to succeed in a big way. We do need to succeed in a big way, and we need to do it quickly. One of them is to reduce the area we have in lawn today. We've got uh, about 44 million acres of lawn, which is uh, bigger than the area of New England, dedicated to an ecological deadscape. Uh, and, and we do that because lawn is a status symbol. And we have to have area to display our Halloween decorations. <laughs> but what if we cut the area of lawn in half? What if we took a, a, something like this and we turned it into that? I got this picture from Dan Getman. 
I don't know Dan Gettner, but he sent me this picture. He said, look, I'm doing it. This used to be online, and I'm putting in native plants. <coughs> I said, OK, great. Well, if we did that on half the area, let's simplify. Let's say we have 44, 40 million acres. We cut that in half. That gives us 20 million acres. We could put towards conservation right at home and create what I'm calling homegrown national park. We're going to create a new national park that would be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite. Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Out of all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park is going to be the biggest park in the country. What do we get when we put a park at home? What do you get when you put some part of nature at home? You get the opportunity to interact with it, to form a relationship with the mother nature that's, that's supporting you. And you can do it at your own time, your own pace. All you have to do is go outside, or even just look out your window. You can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, 375 million people there with you. That was last year's figure. It's free, there's no admission fee. It's never closed, no matter what pandemic's coming down the pike. No travel hassles. To me, those are important pluses. You get to experience the natural world alone, which in, in my view is essential to developing that personal relationship, not mediated by somebody else. And it's particularly important for our poor kids. Richard Lewis says they're suffering from nature deficit disorder. So we're trying, we get 30 kids, we put them on a bus with a teacher, they drive for an hour, and they walk around a natural area for an hour, and the teacher tells them not to touch anything. <laughs> and they get back on the bus, and they go home, and that's their experience with the natural world, which I'm sure is better than nothing. But it's really been an experience with 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have some part of the natural world right where they live, all they have to do is go outside and interact with it, get to know it, fall in love with it. Alone, no parental supervision. Personal relationship, not mediated by parents. When we hover over our kids, we're sending the message that this is dangerous. That you should fear nature. And you hear that on the media all the time. That's not the message we want to send. Our kids are the future stewards of the planet. If they're afraid of it, if they don't know what being a good steward is, if they don't love being a good steward, they're going to be lousy stewards. We can't afford any of that. <coughs> and maybe they'll learn how to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from Zoe. It's my granddaughter who lives in Hawaii. She's the one that gave me this cold. <laughs> She lives in a very modest patch of nature, a little piece of, of lawn and a hedge, but there are no lizards there. And when she discovered that, she sent me this picture to explain how you hunt lizards. You get on the ground, and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards can't see you coming. <laughs> then you crawl slowly towards the lizard. No smiling. This is serious business. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you crawl towards the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put it in an aquarium, you learn how to take care of the lizard. You fall in love with that little piece of, of nature. You become a good steward of that piece of nature, I hope. <coughs> I don't know how many lizards have suffered under his own. <laughs> but it's an important part of, of the process. I don't think Zoe's going to be crawling on the ground, catching lizards in her best dress the rest of her life. I don't think. She sent me this picture, so who knows. <laughs> but I guarantee she's going to remember catching lizards in Hawaii the rest of her life. And I guarantee she's going to be a good steward of the planet, in part because of that experience. Now, if you want your kids to do more than catch lizards, get Nancy Strinisti's Nature Play at home. Dozens of examples of how to expose kids to the natural world right where they live. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, you can do it now. You go to our, our website, homegrownnationalpark.org, and register your property um, on the map. What you're doing is, it's free, by the way, you're, you're putting down your location and the amount of area that you are being a good steward of. Uh, now, you know, nobody's perfect, but driving around the island here, you guys are in pretty good shape. I don't want to, I don't want to imply that there's nothing to do, but you're just starting out in pretty good, good shape, which means most of your properties ought to be on the map. If you're protecting an oak tree, that is space that's a valuable contribution. If you have a pollinator garden, if you're putting one aster in a flower pot, you can join Homegrown National Park. Our goal here is to change the culture as much as it is to add acreage to uh, this, this conservation effort. And when you do that, your, your piece of your county lights up. And the object is to get the whole country to, to light up. We are asking people to reduce the area they have in lawn, 
to plant more natives where that, that, that lawn used to be, to remove invasives. Most species have, most people have invasive plants on their property, to protect natural areas that might be on their, their property. <coughs> the product of Homegrown National Park is national awareness, not just of the problem, but of a solution, a solution that, that everybody can be part of. That's that change culture we're talking about, recognition that nature is not optional, it is essential, and that we all have responsibility to sustaining it. It's also going to provide measurable conservation progress. Uh, you know, we've got the 30-30 initiative. You've heard about the UN's initiative to save 30% of the Earth by 2030. Uh, we can do it, but those areas have to be measurable, and Joining Hunger National Park is a mechanism to do that. All of the, the, the preserved areas on private property can be recorded on Homegrown National Park. And that's one of the benefits. So um, it converts hope into action. Now we're, we talk, we talk, we talk, but this is something we can actually do. It's aspirational. It does not rely on <coughs> governmental support, um, which is, I mean, we, we would love it. But again, grassroots, we're going to do it by ourselves. It merges the existing conservation efforts that are already out there. Audubon, National Wildlife Federation, Wild Ones, there's a lot of people that are active out there. But because we do not charge to be a member, it's not drawing any, anybody away from these organizations. It's just a matter of uniting them all in a visual representation on the map to get this message that we are all part of conservation to go viral. That's the object here. And it's going to provide uh, a visual of our, our progress. <clears throat> so we're going to shrink the lawn. What plants do we put in the area that is now lawn? I'm going to uh, argue that some of them have to be what I call keystone plants. Remember what a keystone is. It's a stone in the middle of the Roman arch. And if you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. But if you take keystone plants out of the local food web, the food web collapses. Because they are making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. So think of the keystone plants in your landscape as the two by fours that are holding up the ecological house you're building. They're the support system. You cannot build a house out of wallpaper, and that's what we've been trying to do for the last century. You're not through building your house once you have your keystone plants, but they're an essential first step. So the question is no longer simply, are natives better ecologically than, than non-natives? Um, on average, they certainly are. But there are a lot of natives that aren't contributing all that much. So the question really is, do we want to, to favor the ones that are contributing the most, the ones that are supporting the most caterpillars, the most pollinators, or not? What is supporting the most caterpillars? It's one of our oaks. That's like, not one, all the oaks put together. Um, I live in the Mid-Atlantic States where they support 557 species of caterpillars, over 950 species nationwide. No other plant genus comes close to that. Tulip trees, good native plants, they support 21. Those huge differences among our native plants and how supportive they are. If you want to know um, uh, the top keystone plants uh, where you live, you go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code, and the ranked list of both the woody plant genera and the herbaceous plant genera that are best at supporting life on, in your county will pop up. Uh, and this is what a typical list looks like over, over much of the country. I'm gonna focus on the herbaceous side there, the, the bars to the right. Goldenrod, asters, native asters, <coughs> and perennial sunflowers, really high plants. Not just in terms of supporting caterpillars, Golden Red support 110 species of, of caterpillars. But in terms of supporting those specialist bees I was talking about. If you have those, those three genera in your yard, there's at least four, 44 species of bees that can also use your yard for reproduction that won't be there if you don't have goldenrods, asters, and, and sunflowers. That's how easily you can rebuild the, the, the uh, productivity of your yard. So we're going to use, we're going to shrink the lawn, we're going to put in keystone plants, we're going to invite a lot of insects to our yard, and then we're going to kill them with our security light, <laughs> which is not the goal. There's a lot of research that is making it clear that light pollution at night is one of the major causes of insect decline around the, the, the world, around the country. These are all the ways that uh, lights are killing our insects, particularly those day flying, or those, uh, those moths that are laying the caterpillars that drive that food web. But to me, this is actually good news. It's good news because we've got to reverse insect decline. 
Not stop it where it is, reverse it. We've already lost more than 45% of the insects on the planet. Look, they're the things that run the world, remember? So we've got to increase them. If we can do that by flicking a switch, we're getting off easy. Now, there's a lot of switches to flick, but uh, we can do that. But I know what you're going to say. I cannot turn off the light over my, my barn, or over my garage, or over my front porch, because the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on it, so it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to realize is the bad man does not come very often. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb that is out of your, sec out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. Yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects than our white wavelengths. Uh, and a yellow LED is, works just as well, and this, of course, is, is more energy efficient. So if we switched out our white bulbs for yellow bulbs overnight, we could save millions of insects, and if we use LEDs, millions of dollars. I'm shrink the lawn, we're going to, to put in keystone plants, we're going to modify our light system, and then we're going to invite Mosquito Joe to come kill all our insects. <laughs> Booming business around the country. Uh, and look, it goes everywhere. Mosquito Joe says, it's okay, because this is a natural product. And he's right, it is a natural product. It's pyrethrites. That is the compound found in chrysanthemums, which evolved to kill insects in chrysanthemums. Now this is industrial state strength uh, pyrethrites. But being natural doesn't mean it's safe. Cyanide is a natural product. So I don't like that argument. The other one is, it only kills mosquitoes. Boy, I wish he was right about that. But in fact, it kills all the insects, including monarchs. Two years ago, hundreds of dead monarchs on the ground when they flew through, through uh, mosquito fog. Um, <clears throat> the interesting thing is, it doesn't control mosquitoes. You don't control mosquitoes in the adult stage. You control them in the larval stage. In order to control mosquitoes in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of them. Mosquito Joe kills between 10 and 50%, not even close to actually being effective, which is why he has to keep coming back and charging you over and over again for something that doesn't work. If you really want to control mosquitoes, we want to do it in the larval stage, and this is a cheap, effective, targeted way to do it with uh, biological control. Get a bucket, fill it full of water. And people say, how big a bucket? I don't care. <laughs> Get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in a handful of straw or hay or, or maybe dead leaves. Um, the object is to, and then you put it out in the sun and let the population of diatoms and algae build up in your bucket. That is what mosquito larvae eat. That becomes an irresistible brew to female mosquitoes that are gonna lay their eggs. They will seek out your bucket, lay their eggs in your bucket, and then you go to the hardware store and you get a sheet of mosquito dunce. That's Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a natural bacterium that only kills aquatic diptera. And you put one of those dunce in your bucket, the eggs hatch, the larvae eat it, and they die. The fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows those caterpillars that are driving our food webs to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Uh, this is just an example, but I, I, uh, I live in, where do I live? Chester County, Pennsylvania where oaks support 511 species of, of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillars eat the leaves, they spin a cocoon and hang from one of the branches, then they emerge as an adult, then they do it all over again. Everything happens on the tree, but that is unusual. Most species, 94% of them, will drop from the tree after they finish growing and wiggle their way beneath the soil surface and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree, and that's the problem. In most places, there is no leaf litter under the tree. We don't tolerate it. And again, looking around here, I, I congratulate you folks. You've got, you've got habitat under your, most of your trees. That's wonderful. But, it, you know, over most of the country, we don't, it's messy. We mow and compact our soils underneath the, our trees so that it's too hard for the caterpillars to get underground. So this creates an ecological trap. If this is a, a, a good tree, the moths will come in, lay their eggs, the caterpillars will dry, uh, will develop and drop down and then die. And if we do this across the country, the population gets smaller every year. And that, of course, is what's, what's happening. And of course, the cement landscape is not the answer either. This is what most people do. They have a, 
a tree in a yard. I've got a new grad student this summer that's measuring how well caterpillars do in a situation like this, but I guarantee they're gonna do better in a situation like this where you have a layered landscape. You've got your tree, maybe a dogwood here, native azalea, ferns, and ground cover. It's soft landing. Caterpillars fall down. The ground is not compacted. They can easily get underground and pupate. They can easily spin a cocoon in the leaf that's under there. Survivorship will be much higher. This is where you can do your, your fancy gardening under your trees. Maybe spring ephemerals. This is how you reduce the lawn. You have a tree in your yard, put a bed around that tree. The bigger, the better, and then you have less lawn. It's all wonderful safe sites. Use uh, native ground covers liberally. Things like uh, wild ginger or uh, native pachysandra. There's Virginia creeper as a good ground cover. Golden seal, may apple, foam flower, ferns. If you can see the ground, in, in a lot of situations, uh, you don't have enough plants. Green mulch is the very best way to go. It's all safe sites for those caterpillars. Uh, another former grad student, Desiree Narango, did some wonderful uh, work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. And uh, her results suggest that there's actually room for compromise in our plant choice. And, and that's, uh, that's good news to me. You may have heard recently that that I'm a nativist and I don't like compromise. I've just heard that. Uh, look, our data says we can compromise. And by the way, if I don't compromise, I'm just the messenger. The monarch is not going to compromise. I'm not going to start to eat your hostas. It's stuck with, with uh, milkweed, so I'm just the messenger. Anyway, we can compromise. She asked one, uh, one simple question. How well do chickadee populations Persist. How well do they do in landscapes that are dominated by native plants versus landscapes dominated by introduced ornamentals? Uh, and when they're dominated by introduced ornamentals, they produce 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, you reduce the, the bird food by 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So their nest boxes up in every yard that the chickadees would come and look around and say, there's not enough food here, we're not even going to try to breed. If they did try to breed, they, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. Uh, if they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and it took them 1.5 days longer to do that. And when you put all that together into a population growth curve, that, uh, as a function of the percentage of non-native plant biomass, woody plant biomass in your yard, from none to 100%, this is what you get. So right there, which you can see my little pointer, is where those lines uh, intersect, which liberally speaking suggests you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass, non-native, without crashing your local food web. That's the area of compromise. You can have your, your crepe myrtle without destroying the landscape, as long as it doesn't dominate the landscape, as long as 70% of your woody plant biomass is native. Remember Dan Getman? This plant over here on the, the right is a ginkgo. A ginkgo biloba from Asia. Why does Dan have a ginkgo in his native plant garden? Because his wife said, Dan, I want a ginkgo. <laughs> so he put it in. Is that ginkgo destroying the functionality of that landscape? No. Is it, is it invasive? Is it gonna move around and replace everything in natural areas? No, it's just there. So I like to think of these plants as if they were statues. So there's, there's <laughs> one statue. <laughs> if every plant there was a statue, it would be a problem, but it's not for me. So it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food groups. It's the absence of the native productive plants. If we get more of them into our landscapes, we can tolerate uh, the non-problematic ones. Now we don't, None of these, these that 30% I'm talking about, can be invasive. We can't tolerate those because they, those are ecological tumors. They just keep growing and spreading and growing. But plenty of our, our um, non-native ornamentals are not invasive. They are not moving. Can we use native plants in formal designs? Um, of course we can. This is a Lynn O'Shaughnessy design sent to me a couple of years ago, taken from a drone 400 feet up. You don't get more formal than that. And every plant in that landscape is a native plant. Formality is a function of the design, not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess it's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a pollinator garden into a, a landscape like this, a suburban landscape, without offending anybody? 
Of course we can. Put a little fence around it. It formalizes it. It tells your neighbor, I did this on purpose. <laughs> this is not a bunch of weeds I forgot to mow. <laughs> it's beautiful when it's in bloom. Um, it's not very big, but uh, it's still meeting the needs of some of our bees. If everybody did this, it would meet the needs of a lot of our bees. And remember why we need bees. You hear because they pollinate a third of our crops. That's a terrible argument in my, my view. Then people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any, any pollinators. Forget the crop argument. It's only 12%, by the way, not 30. We need pollinators because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. Where do we need pollinators? Everywhere we need plants. If we lost them, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. That is not an option. How about this? A Drew Latham design is much bigger. Imagine the amount of life supported here versus the amount of life supported here. Seems like a no-brainer. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can. Many of them are doing it these days, too. Minnesota has done it for several years now. Cost-sharing program where they're helping homeowners replace some or all of their lawn with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. Very positive. There's an island off of Florida that's paying residents to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. If you have an endangered species on your property, we're gonna pay you to be a good steward of that species rather than, than fine you if you use your property. Everybody would want an endangered species. <laughs> Put a bounty on these invasive ornamentals like cattle repair. That's what St. Louis, Missouri did, Fayetteville, Arkansas, South Carolina. Yeah. I think you banned them all together. I yeah. Oh, it's not yet? All right. It's North Carolina's got a ban, ban yeah. but you take take one out, you get a free free tree replacement. Um, utilities are giving people hundred dollar coupons to put in water efficient native plants, and of course the big um, lawn replacement programs, primarily in California, that's going up. You get three dollars per square foot rebate for every square foot of lawn that you take out and replace with xeric planting. California does not have one drop of water to waste on on uh, lawn. You know who the very worst water offender is in Hollywood? Kardashian. Kim Kardashian. <laughs> she's, she's thumbing her nose at the water regulations, if you can believe that. Uh, and if you want uh, more information on all those programs, then memorize that. <laughs> all right, I think we made three missteps in the early years of conservation. The first one is important. We've, we've started to think of nature as if it's optional. We like it, we like to visit it, uh, but it's not essential. And that means when push comes to shove and, and uh, resources are in short supply, which is always, nature takes a back seat. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo uh, before the virus broke out, and there's this wall-sized poster there, which to me epitomizes our society's view of conservation. We want to save wildlife, we want to save nature so that future generations can enjoy it. Uh, and I understand that. It was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for creating the national park system. We want to save these beautiful places so that future generations can enjoy them. Uh, and, you know, nature is enormously entertaining, but it's much more than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. It's not going to happen without nature. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. And we talked about this, but if we restrict conservation efforts just to the areas where there's no humans or very few, we're going to fail. Because those areas are too small and too isolated. David Quammen has a wonderful uh, analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. <laughs> that is 71 rug fragments. None of which are functioning as a Persian rug. And that's what we have done to our ecosystem. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that language because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, including our roadsides, even including much of our agriculture. So we need to glue our rug back together again, folks. We need to put the plants back, not just to create biological corridors that connect viable habitats, but to restore places where we've destroyed viable habitats, all those areas where, where we live, work, and play. We're gonna put the plants back, and when we do, and we've started, uh, 
it'll be the first time in modern history that we humans have coexisted with the natural world. Our third best step is to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists. For some reason, a few ecologists, a few, few conservation biologists, for some reason we did not see it as an inherent responsibility of every single person on the planet, whether you are a tree hugger or not. But I don't know why, because every single person on the planet, whether you're a tree hugger or not, depends entirely on the quality of your local ecosystem. So why wouldn't everybody bear the responsibility of protecting those ecosystems? We have the strangest relationship now with, with Mother Nature. We've got a few people to protect it. Everybody else has a green light to destroy it. That's not working. Stan Rushworth, Cherokee elder, once said the, the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. Mm -hmm. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with those mindsets. You're taught them. We are very good at teaching this. We've been very poor at teaching our kids and our peers that we all have obligations to good earth stewardship. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you can save it where you live. And if you do, it empowers you. Now, more and more people are recognizing the earth is in trouble. It has lots of big problems, but most people throw up their hands and say, what can one person do? One person can shrink the lawn, one person can put in a pollinator garden, one person can get rid of the invasives on their property, we didn't even talk about that. One person can fire Mosquito Joe, one person can use keystone plants, one person can do a lot of things to totally revitalize their, their little part of the earth on which they, they uh, exist. And then enhance their, their local ecosystem instead of degrade it. And it shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for everybody. Don't worry about the entire planet's problems, you will get depressed. Just worry about the piece of the earth that you can influence. If you own property, it's obvious. That's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy. Help a park, help a preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So as a property owner or a volunteer, each one of us has the power. We certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is gonna determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own. So I think I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much.